Well, welcome back, everybody. And uh, we've really nailed down our polar slope the last couple of days. We've been able to find where the curve has horizontal or vertical tangent lines, and we've been able to write the equation of, of other various tangent lines and so forth. And now we're ready to graduate on to a totally new topic called the area within a polar curve. And it's, it's really a drastically different way of thinking. For instance, um, when we first introduced area of a rectangular graph, uh, you know, several, several months ago, we said, you know, we're going to chop that region into an infinite number of very thin rectangles, and then we're going to add all those rectangles together, uh, that, and those, uh, each rectangle is infinitely thin. Well, today, we're going to think in terms of a sector, okay? That's the new buzzword we're going to use for a little while. And basically, a sector is a geometric shape uh, that looks like a slice of pizza. What we've got here is we've got two straight edges, but it's not a triangle because the third boundary is curved, okay? So a sector, it's similar to a triangle, but not the same. And so because of that one curved edge, the area formula gets a little tricky. And that's what we've done here on the left side with this circle, is we've created a sector. Um, you know, if we assume that we have zero degrees right here, we're going to rotate up, and that first smaller angle is going to be theta sub 1, and then we're going to rotate up here, and that larger angle is going to be theta sub 2. And what that's done is it's created, um, you know, a nice wedge-shaped, a sector shape. And I want you to be able to try to, can you, um, with, with the knowledge that you have currently, find a, a general formula for the area of that sector? And I would encourage you to take a moment to try to think about this. Uh, historically, there's always been a couple of students in each class that have uh, you know, come up with a little formula for the area of this sector completely on their own without me saying anything about it. So I'd encourage you to try to do so now on your own. So I think the key to building this area formula is to think of that as a certain percentage of the overall circle. Now, the overall area of the entire circle is, whoops, i got to grab my pen there. Uh, the area of the circle is, of course, pi r squared. But we're not looking for the entire circle. We're only looking for a certain chunk or percentage of it. And the percentage that we're looking for is, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the difference of those two thetas and divide them by the entire circle. So it's part to whole. Um, and the theta sub 2 minus theta sub 1 divided by 2 pi will tell me what percentage of the circle I'm looking for. And, of course, I just multiply that by pi over 2. Now, what we're going to do here and, and hopefully maybe you saw this coming moments earlier. And instead of dividing um, these intervals into infinitely thin rectangles, we're going to start to divide them into infinitely thin sectors. And so what happens is we want the difference of these two theta values. Well, first of all, let's just call it delta theta, okay, or the difference in our theta value. All right. Um, what we want to happen is we want that change in theta to become infinitely small. So small, in fact, that we start to use this notation d theta. Um, and that just means it's getting infinitely small. Of course, we could say the pi's cancel out. And then we could say r squared over 2 represents the area of one really, really, really thin sector. And then if you want to take an infinite number of really thin sectors and add them together... That's where the integral comes into play. Usually I pull the one half out, I put my r squared here, and then for bounds, I'm gonna use alpha to beta to represent the, the bounds. Instead of a to b, I'm gonna go alpha to beta. So there's our generic new formula today. Um, we'll make it look a little fancier here in the next couple of slides, but that's generally where we're going today. My next goal is to talk about a little uh, terminology and vocabulary. You've probably heard me use the phrase radial line a few times. Basically a radial line um, is any line that starts at the pole and extends out um, at a certain angle. Uh, so here's my first radial line, and then what's happening is that radial line is sweeping in a counterclockwise motion. And what we're doing is we're getting, you know, a radial line there and there and there, and then lastly we get one right here at beta. All right, so basically from now on, whenever I say radial line, I want you to think of a wiper blade, all right? I want you to think wiper blade. It has a pivot point, and then it's just rotating um, around that pivot point. And in this case, it's as it's rotating or sweeping throughout that yellow region, it's gobbling up chunks of area and kind of, you know, accumulating and keeping a cumulative total. 
So generally speaking, here's we're, we're going to get our definitions and our writing out of the way here on this slide, then we'll jump into some real live problems. But generally, think of the area enclosed by a polar equation as an infinite number of very thin, very, very, very thin uh, sectors or pizza slices or wedges or whatever word you prefer right there. All right. Now the key here is that delta theta that we described or the change in theta will be very, very small. Okay. It, we want it to be infinitely small. And lastly, Okay, if we think of adding up an infinite number of really thin, thin, thin sectors, we're going to get this formula right here. Oops. Let's see if we can drag that up here. Here's what our formula is going to look like. Now, notice the notation is just a little different. Instead of just r squared, I wrote, uh, we wrote r of theta squared right there. Just, it's kind of like saying f of x, but, uh, you know, in terms of our new variables. And uh, the hardest thing today by a mile is going to be getting these bounds, okay? Um, you know, figuring out what function integrates is not going to be a hard thing. Uh, remembering your squared is not going to be hard. Remembering your coefficient is not going to be hard. Getting the correct bounds is what's going to separate, um, you know, the threes from the fours and the fours from the fives on the exam. So just to confirm what we said on the last slide, the hardest part today is going to be getting the correct bounds. Um, especially uh, tomorrow when we talk about the area between two polar curves. If we can get our hands on the correct bounds, the rest of our job is extremely easy. Um, and then there's, there's two new identities. Um, what's going to happen is as you're integrating these, once you get them set up, you're going to have to integrate cosine squared a lot. And integrating cosine squared is kind of impossible right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this new random identity called 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta all over 2. And then what we could do is we could make like a beaver and rewrite that as one half plus one half cosine of two theta. And then we could just do a little u sub on that inner function and integrate it quite nicely. And then similarly speaking, sine squared of theta is almost identical. The only difference is we're going to uh, throw a, a minus sign into there. Um, so it looks like this. Again, we're going to split it up. We'll write one half minus one half of cosine of two theta. Do a little u sub on the inner function, and again, it becomes very integratable. So there's two new identities that we're going to refer back to today. Um, the good news is, is I, I cannot recall the last time where you had to have those memorized on the exam. Most of the time it's going to be set up only, or if they want you to evaluate, they're going to make it calculator active. But there's nothing in the curriculum that says they couldn't ask us to do it without the calculator. So that's why I always introduce these two identities. We'll throw them on some quizzes and we'll try to be prepared just in case they do ask us to do that. All right, it's time for our first example, and we're going to try to find the area enclosed by the polar graph, r equals 1 plus the cosine of theta. Um, I hope we're getting comfortable enough that maybe we could skip the rectangular graph and go straight to the polar graph, um, but if I'm rushing you in that regards, then by all means, take the extra time to draw that, um, draw that rectangular graph first. But what you'll notice is that uh, the coefficient a is equal to b, so we've got ourselves a cardioid in this case. And this particular cardioid is going to start over here at 2. It's going to go up to 1. It's going to have a sharp cusp there at the pole at pi, negative 1, and then finish back at 2. So it's going to look a little something like this. Ooh, not too bad, not too bad. Now, as far as finding the area of that, we know that our formula says it's 1 half integral from alpha to beta, and then the function, r of theta squared, and d theta is infinitely small. All right, so, so here's the easy part. All right, you know that it's just going to be the function 1 plus cosine of theta squared. All right, every student taking this exam is going to have at least that much on their paper. What's going to separate you from the rest of the pack is whether we get the correct bounds, and this is a very nice one here. Um, how many radians does it take to complete a full cycle? Um, we started right here at 0 degrees or radians. We rotate it up. Here's where pi over 2 is right there. We swung down to pi. We swung down to 3 pi over 2. And then we finished at 2 pi. So the integral starts at 0 and it ends at 2 pi because that's how many radians it took to complete the whole cycle. And what I want you to do is I want you to just visualize a whole bunch of radial lines, a.k.a. wiper blades, that are rotating. Okay, They even rotate back there rotate in this fashion 
and they're just sweeping throughout that region infinitely thin sectors and we're going to add them all up. So this is the one that we're actually going to evaluate by hand. Um, the next two examples will kind of cheat a little bit and do setup only or throw them in the calculator. So as far as integrating this goes, my first step is we're just going to go ahead and foil that puppy out. So we got 1 plus 2 cosine of theta plus the cosine squared of theta d theta. Now we can think of this because there's three separate terms, we can think of it as three separate integrals. Uh, the first term being very simple, the second term being very simple, but this third term here being the nasty one and that's where we're going to use our identity. So we've got one half the integral from 0 to 2 pi, 1 plus 2 cosine. And don't get ahead of yourself, don't start integrating those first two terms beforehand. We want to make sure that we are consistent and integrate at the same time all the way across cosine of 2 theta. Notice I've already taken that identity and split it up. Um, now I can combine like terms. The first term here and the third term are like terms. So we're just going nice and slow here. Nothing too crazy. So we've got 3 halves plus 2 cosine of theta plus 1 half cosine of 2 theta. Again, we're going to have to do a little use up on that last term. Whether you decide to show it on your paper or not, that's a whole other question. And I'm not too worried about that. In fact, I'm going to try and encourage you to do it without showing any work. All right, I think we're ready to integrate. Bring down your coefficient. Um, now, we're integrating with respect to theta. So we wouldn't want to say 3 halves x. We want to say 3 halves theta. And then we're going to say plus 2 sine of theta would be his antiderivative. And then we're going to do a little use up. I think we're getting um, positive 1 fourth sine of 2 theta because of the fact that we let u equal the 2 theta and did a little work there. Um, and then our bounds are 0 to 2 pi. And now we're ready to just start plugging and chugging. Um, when I substitute the 2 pi, I got 3 pi uh, da, 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 plus 0 um, plus, now the sine of 4 pi is, is also 0 minus, uh, plug in 0, we got 0 plus 0 uh, plus zero. Wow, there's a lot of zeros. Good stuff. So the time, by the time I'm all done, I've got 3 pi over 2, and that represents the total area enclosed by the cardioid we had there. So hopefully you liked uh, working that one out by hand. Not too bad. Brought back some good review. Here's a very popular AP question, and this is kind of why uh, this explains our infatuation with those limicons with the inner loops all along. Is because we've kind of been building up to this moment right here. Um, I want you to consider the curve r equals 1 plus 2 cosine of theta. And they want not the area enclosed by the entire curve, but just the area enclosed by the inner loop alone. And again, I'm going to try to fast forward just to the polar graph. Oh, I wanted a thicker pen. Let's see if we got it here. Okay, there it is. Now what's going to happen here is I can visualize that it, uh, there's 1, 2, and 3. It's going to start all the way out here at 3. Um, it's going to work its way uh, to a height of 1. We're going to cross the pole, start the inner loop, come back through the pole, finish down here. So I'm picturing a little something like this. Okay, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the area of this inner loop. Now, actually, the radial lines are going to start here. And then they're going to work them way, the way up through the top. And it's basically a matter of deciding when does that inner loop start and when does it end, okay? Because here's what every student, every single student is going to have this on their paper, all right? This is not the hard part. They're going to remember the formula. It's a matter of getting those bounds. And we've got to figure out when that loop started and ended. So here's a situation where I might go back here and I might try to draw that rectangular curve. I think this is really going to help. Okay, let's go up one unit, and then we've got an amplitude of two. So we're going to go two units above. We're going to start at three. There's pi over two. Um, then we're going to go two units below, so we're down here at negative one. And the question becomes, when did this rectangular graph cross the x-axis, okay? Right there, that represents the moment the inner loop started, and this right here represents the moment that the inner loop ended. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set that curve equal to zero. And let's see, when does cosine of theta equal negative one half? Well, that's a reference angle of 60. Um, second quadrant would be 120 degrees, and then 240 degrees. And of course, we want those in radians. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. So I'm thinking 2 pi over 3, and then 4 pi over 3 would be the appropriate radians. So let's slide back up here. 
and let's throw bounds. We'll say the lower bounds 2 pi over 3, and of course the upper bounds 4 pi over 3. Now one thing they might do that's interesting is maybe this is what you have for your setup and you're looking at the multiple choices and they don't have anything that looked like that. What could we do to get creative and express an equivalent one? Well, let's see. We could kind of cut the interval in half. Let's go from 2 pi over 3. Let's see if you can read this. And then we'll stop halfway at pi. Pi is halfway to 4 pi over 3. And then because that's only halfway, then we'll double that answer to kill the coefficient. And then you have the same quantity here getting squared. So this is an equivalent setup where we go halfway and then double our answer to kill that coefficient. So these two are the same, and you might see that in a multiple choice. Our third and final example, they want the area enclosed by just one petal on the curve r equals 8 cosine of 3 theta. One of the nice things, you remember if the uh, frequency is an odd number like we have here, then you're going to have exactly that number of petals. Um, if my 3 magically changed to a 4, then I would have 8 petals instead of 4. But uh, the good news is here we only have 3. And again, we're going to try to skip that rectangular graph if you feel comfortable doing so. And I'm visualizing the cosine curve starting way out there at 8. So I'm going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the right there is where my curve's going to start. And then what's going to happen is it's going to swoop from here to here first. All right. And then it's going to dive into that third quadrant. Then it's going to jump up into the second quadrant. And then it's going to loop back around and finish that loop. Now, yeah, this is not a very good looking one. My petals are a little unproportional size wise. But the key here is, is we want to jump on the area of just one of those petals. And um, getting the bounds, like we always say, is the trickiest part. So here's how I like to attack it, and I, I think this will make life. I want to focus on just the upper half of this pedal, okay? And we know that the pedal started right here at zero radians, but the question is, when did that top half of the pedal end? But the bottom, once I, I want to focus on the area of just this half a pedal, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to double that answer to then produce the area of the entire pedal. So the question becomes, when did that upper half of the pedal end? Remember when we graphed this one rectangularly? We said the um, period, you know, let's say if that's pi over 2 and that's pi and that's 3 pi over 2, et cetera, et cetera, we said we'll probably break this count by increments of 30. So we got 30, 60, 90, and then 120. Um, 2 pi over 3, which is equates to that hash mark right there, tells me how soon I have to finish that first cycle. So the cosine curve would have started way up here, would have swooped down to there, yada yada. Uh, we'd have ended here, here, and here. Okay, but this part's not as important to me. I want to focus on that rascal right there. That x-intercept, that very first x-intercept is going to tell me um, when that first loop, uh, the top half of that first loop ended. Uh, so that's going to be right at 30 degrees, which is pi over 6. So I'm going to make a note that we hit the pull at pi over 6. So I'm going to integrate from 0 radians to pi over 6. And what's going to happen is that only represents half the pedal, so I double it, killing the coefficient, and then I have my 8 cosine of 3 theta quantity squared d theta. So there's a nice one setup only. Um, and I want you to hopefully understand where that upper bound came from and why we killed the coefficient of 1 half. If I put the 1 half here, that would only represent the top half of the pedal. We had to double it to get the entire pedal, including the bottom half. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense today. I hope you can understand the concept behind where the formula came from, how we're going to apply it, and to really put your energy into getting the correct bounds. Good luck. We'll see you tomorrow.